Thank you for coming. There is no test at the end of this, <laughs> except the one that you live every day. The invisible jazz labs, and the problem that we have is not the problem with the invisible, because we don't have to see that. The problem is with the visible, and the visible is always this problem because eventually you can't ignore it, and then you have to draw conclusions that you might not want to draw. The biggest question we have, the one we all have, is how big is the world? Is there stuff that we haven't seen yet? Is there stuff that's beyond what we've cataloged on the edge of the map or, I don't know, once the map no longer has edges because it's a globe, you know, outside the globe? The problem is, is that as soon as we get used to how big things are, just about right after, I'm cosmologist, so that might be 100 years, but it's pretty fast. Just about then, we realize that the world is a lot bigger than we thought it was. What we had just gotten used to was something that tormented us and finally pleased us. We found a way to be at the center of things again. And maybe we felt even better, right? Because instead of just being at the center of Pittsburgh, we were at the center of the globe, the center of the solar system. So let's go 500 years ago, and you're lying in Shenley Park looking up, which is already strange, I guess. And you look up at the stars. The stars for us, they're beautiful. They're a projection. They're a light show every night. You can see them, you can tell stories about them, you can entertain people. They're like a movie for us. They're projected up on a screen, and if you think about it for a second, if I look up there and there's a star, and I look up over there and there's a star, well, I guess the screen must be a really big curve. We call that the celestial sphere. And these things have been put up there to entertain us. It's an accident, by the way. Things that could have been slightly different and we would never have seen them. They're tiny dots of lights, and there's no reason for us to be able to see them. There's no evolutionary advantage to it, but we saw them fine, okay. And so we say, up there is a show, and every night Orion rises, Andromeda sets. It's a story. It's a beautiful thing. And then at some point you say, well, okay, look, it's a screen, right? It's a movie. I'm watching a movie. So how far back am I sitting? Did I get a front row seat for the universe? And then you start to realize, well, obviously you can't touch the stars, and John doesn't have a ladder for the star gels. We've never actually gone there. So how far away are the stars? Well, one thing we know, they rise and they set 24 hours. So they could be just about outside of our reach, and they're just kind of slowly walking, like somebody on the horizon. The further out you put them, the faster and faster that sphere has to spin to keep up. But it's spinning fast and far away. It's spinning slow and close in. Who's to say? We only have one ruler, and it's a clock. We've never touched them. Really, in the end, the question of how far away the stars are is theological, because whatever's outside of that sphere is probably not our domain. Something a bit bigger than us. But then something happened, and you know this story. It's a story that we tell. It's part of our scientific myth that one day we realized that even though it looked like the sun ran around us, Actually, we were going around the sun. So there's this old joke, you know, it doesn't look that way. Wittgenstein said, well, what would it look like if it was the other way? Exactly the same. So we tell this story. We're going around the sun, and that's fine. But then there's this problem, because if we're moving around the sun, and the sun's at the center, where's the sphere? Well, the sphere must be around the sun. So now, instead of sitting down in the center of this theater, we're starting to walk 
Every year, we do a revolution around that central projection point. And now you have a problem because if we do move relative to the stars, we start to see them come in and out of alignment with each other. Things that were close to this tree or that tree, now, six months later, they're off. They've moved because you've moved. So there's something we know, all educated you know, people of the 1580s, or they all knew we went around the sun, but the stars didn't move. So there was a problem. It's a very minor problem. It's not a problem that you would spend too much time thinking about. But it was indeed a problem. And in fact, you know, when you get into these arguments about how big is the universe, how big are things, well, sometimes people say there's a subtle effect that we didn't see. And then you say, how big would this theater have to be if the stars didn't move at all? If we couldn't even see it move, no matter how good we are. So you come and you do this calculation and you write it down and these people did this calculation. You can write it out and you say to yourself, wait a second, that's such a big number that it's like a joke. It's a joke number. We got used to the Earth being big. We got used to the Sun being far away from the Earth. But this number that we've written down, this number that would have to be the case for the stars not to move every year as we went around the Sun, that would mean the universe was very, very large indeed. Absurdly large. And why did God make all that wasted space? What was his job with all this silence? So, obviously it can't be true. The universe is a beautiful thing. It's meant for us. And eventually, maybe 100, 200 years later, they finally built a machine that could see what happened every year. They could see this tiny motion that stars made as they went around and we went around. And then they could do the calculation. And they knew it was big. They knew it was bigger than us, bigger than the Earth, fine. Bigger than the Sun, fine. Bigger than the solar system, that's fine. But how much bigger? Incredible. So the scientists, you know, they, they do this and they write it down and they, they tell people and then they tell the poets. The poets freak out. Coleridge says he wants to vomit when he thinks about how far away these things have got to be. It's like, well, he was. It's like being on drugs. Pascal saw it a bit earlier. He said, these infinite spaces terrify me. And all this stuff had nothing to do with us. Nothing to do with what was happening here. That light show didn't have to be built that way. It could have been close enough in for everything to work out just fine. It's what the visible does. The visible tells you things that if you listen closely enough will tell you something. might not tell you what you want to hear. And that's the problem, because if you listen very closely to the movement of the stars, to the music of the stars, to the music of the spheres, it was a chord so low, infrasonic. So now we're at 1800, 1850. The machines get better. The telescopes get better. They take photographs. We can map it all out, and now, okay, fine. Maybe we can come to terms with the fact that the Earth is here, and there's all this stuff out there. You map it, make a three-dimensional map. 
And so the edges, okay, there was a space, but now we have gaps between them. This is closer than that. Alpha Centauri is closer than Pegasus Minor. There are actually three Alpha Centauri's. C is closest to us. It only got bigger, but now it's fine, right? So there's something off the coast of the country. Maybe it's Asia. There's something off the coast of Asia. Maybe it's Australia. But this expansion now, it doesn't make us feel small. It makes us feel big. So that's where the invisible sat for another 100 years. Until 1901, 02, when all the things that we had learned, all the things that we knew about the world were starting to pile up, all the explanations that worked so well, all the eclipses we could predict, those things started to fight. One idea said this, another idea said that. We took objects that we understood and we made them smaller and smaller in our imaginations and we made them smaller and smaller in the world. And the world exceeded our imaginations. Something that shouldn't have happened, happened. The stars moved. It didn't just happen once. It happened every time they did it. And the smaller the thing they cared about, the more and more it happened. It was a subtle thing. You can break a telescope. Spinoza did. You can ruin an apparatus. In this case, you could make it all work out if you got a bit too close. And when things started seeming strange, when they were doing things they shouldn't have done, when they were doing things that defied the imagination, if you went in and just looked behind the curtain, it was gone. So what were those things? Fine. Electrons, like on a television screen, coming off a bulb filament. Particles that came out of a speck of gold. They did this early experiment where they threw these things, these tiny, tiny objects, at the thinnest gold film they could find. They shot them through. And all of them went through, except maybe one in a million. And the millionth one bounced back. Eddington said it was like firing a cannonball at a sheet of tissue paper and getting hit in the face. Now, actually, we think that a one in a million shot like that is actually a pretty good rate of getting things back, it's called a cross section. and. Uh, Something on the order of one in a million is called a barn. It's called a barn because it's like hitting the broad side of a barn. We don't think that's so big anymore. But back then, it was, a, it was a big deal for them. And they couldn't escape the fact that the world was full of these tiny, tiny things, that what was continuous was an illusion, and that the very things that we held on to were all the things that misbehaved when we looked too close. So what was it like? What was it like when we picked one of these things up, when we took one of these tiny bits of our world? How did it disturb us? Well, we'd pick one up, and we'd throw it against the wall. And we'd do it again with another one, and again. And they'd interact, they'd see each other, they'd bounce off each other maybe, 
they'd get close enough to disturb each other. And they'd make a pattern. They'd make a moiré grid, a series of waves. It's like hitting a drum with a drum head. We knew that. But then we turned down the volume and we thinned things out. And instead of throwing them three at a time, we just took one very, very carefully and we threw it. And it should have drawn a straight line. It should have made a patch on the other side, on a photographic plate. We should have seen a smudge, some blurring out, fine. We didn't quite know where we threw it. We didn't see a smudge. We saw the same pattern we had seen when we threw all of them at once. We understood the pattern when all of them were together. We understood why, when we threw all of them at once into the wall, they made some elegant shapes, waves, circles. But who was there to tell the one on her own how to make the pattern? If there was no one else to jostle her, if there was no one else to bump in, how did she know where to go? Why wasn't it simple? Well, what we started to talk about, the story we started to tell, was that those things we didn't throw were actually thrown. That they were all there at the same time as the one we threw and yet we never saw them. They were ghost partners. They were things there to drive whatever the one that was went. Some people called it the pilot wave. There was an invisible guider, a helmsman that steered everything and told a little story to that single isolated being about how to pretend that everybody else was there. This is, not a great, this is not a great scientific story, okay? This is not how you're meant to do science. You're not meant to actually stick a tiny little scientist behind everything, making it all work out. So we tried again. Some people said, and this was what they said in Copenhagen, it's called the Copenhagen interpretation, is that sure, there's something funny happening over here, but I'm not going to look until it's over. Looks fine to me. This caused us a lot of problems because we actually weren't sure, as scientists, when we were meant and not meant to look. I was taught this version in the 90s when I was a student, and that was the hardest part of the class, right? There was a bunch of mathematics, and that wasn't too bad for us. It was just the professor always knew when you were allowed to look and when you weren't allowed to look. And I think secretly they made the mathematics harder so that we wouldn't ask him that question. Nineteen fifty-seven, man called Hugh Everett. Fun fact the father of the lead singer of the Eels. Everett was a strange man. He was the graduate student of one of the greatest quantum physicists that they had at the time, Wheeler. And Everett was disturbed by this story they were always asked to tell. He was disturbed by the fact that even though you could do all the calculations just fine, there was something behind the screen that you couldn't pull back. And so Everett told a different story. He said, while the thing you look at is moving forward, as she's coming forward, and you're going to have to slow this one down for me here, 
like real slow. As she's coming forward, all these things, right, that we said couldn't be there because we'd switched it down, we knew there was only going to be one at the end. Somehow, we couldn't hold these ones back. So as this one moved, these ones pushed her. When we looked at the plate, we only saw the one in the middle. Only one. What were these ghostly creatures? Who were they? Where did they come from? The obvious thing is to say, well, they were here. They were just too brief to see. They were things that could have been, but we missed them on the plate. I mean, you're going to do a lot of things, right, if you can't, if you can't tell this story right. But whatever it said was that every time we ran this, every time we sent this one forward, there were others that we could have sent forward in her place. And what I mean by that is not that we could have, but we didn't, but that there's actually not just three of them, but three of me. There's a Simon who sent the one in the middle. There's a Simon who sent the one on the left. And there's a Simon who sent the one on the right. Now, I'm the Simon who sent the one in the middle. I only see her. But the problem is that she still moves, just like the stars did. And because the stars moved, we had to change our story. And because she moved, we had to change our story. Now, what do you say? about something that does something, something that causes something. She's here and not there because of these. They did something. They're real. What can it mean to exist except to cause things? Or what can it mean to say, Something that didn't exist caused it. We're stuck over and over again with this problem. We want to change our language. We want to move things around. But we're faced with the problem that if she moved and they pushed her, and there are three Simons, and they exist, I'm just slowing this down, right? They exist, then I exist. Three times over. There's a world of left-hand Simons and right-hand Simons, just as much as there's a world of middle-hand Simons. You're seeing the middle-hand Simon. This is the story we're telling. But I could just as well have told this whole story on the left or on the right. I could have been the person who sneezed when he hit the button and so she was there and she was him or I could have scratched my nose and she was her and she was there. This is an elegant way of talking. It's a bit mystical. They actually shut Everett out of the whole thing. They said it would actually be a kind of, you couldn't say this because you wouldn't get your PhD if you said this. Right? So this is, you know, it's not quite the Pope, right? Being tortured by the Catholic Church is not like failing out of graduate school. But it's close, 
for some people. And Wheeler actually, he was a complicated man because he wrote this down and he saw this story, right? He was the guy who said that these are real. Ha! Huh, these are real. And so whoever sent them must be real. And if you can't see that person, it doesn't mean they're not there. So what he realized, and the story he told, was that it's not just that these people are here, but that there's three Simons walking around as well. Just as he could have gone that way, but didn't. And in fact, she did. So there is a Simon who is walking this way simultaneously with a Simon who is walking this way. And just about tinily enough, that Simon pushes on me. There are some problems when we all start <laughs> interacting with each other. There are some problems when we let these fine, these, these fairy tale stories about tiny things that push upon each other's potentialities. And they're not potentialities because I've never been, I don't know, arrested by a potentiality. What happens when we start mingling ourselves with what we know must be true is that all the things that could have happened did. They actually did. They're real. Fine, they pushed him and we never saw them, but that pushing happened. Somebody pushed him. And so, if I'm real, and the scratching the nose me is real, and the sneezing me is real, then the decision-making other me is real. The things we could have done are real. They pull. They tug. It really happened that you did that horrible thing. It really happened that you didn't break in time. It really happened that you didn't get lucky the way you did in this world. Good news is if you had bad luck, there's someone out there who had good luck. This is a philosophical problem, of course, too, because now I really have done all those awful things. So have you. And we know that because we can look at a tiny decision and we see the ghost effects of that. People tried to get out of Everett and they said, okay, look, um, you got a knob, right? And um, if you make these people large enough, then there's a little click, excuse me, there's a click when they get big and then this all, it's fine again and there's only him and, and it all relaxes back to normal. There's some, you know, don't look too close at the matrix, right? Don't, don't put your nose against the screen because you'll see the dots. Um, there is no screen. There's no magical cutoff valve for reality. As big as we can tell this story, it still seems to hold. We like to show off about it now. So uh, the Viennese did this uh, across the city of Vienna. They had a particle, effectively, like, don't sue me, this is not the problem set. They had a particle that traveled all the way across that city, very slowly. Thank you. And all the other things that could have been in the city of Vienna, that's you, were there to guide her and bump into her, make decisions for her, help her out. We never saw them on the other side, but nor did we see the experimenter sitting at the University of Vienna, home of Schrodinger and Karl Popper, 
and briefly Freud, they never saw all of those other copies of them doing the same things, pushing their copies around, just as much as she is pulled around by her invisible beings. These are her. What you can't see is me. Why did we do that? Well, there's a lot of things you can do with this now. If there are all these worlds out there that are pushing the things that we can see around, what if we can control them? I can move her. This is what we call classical physics. But always when I was moving her, I was kind of battling with all these other things around me that were bumping her around. And of course, actually what I was doing was fighting with myself because I was the one who brought those into being. So really, it's actually this big kind of battle between copies of myself. This is all really true, actually. But what if I could calm my other copies down? What if I could arrange it so that the me here, this one, and the me just a little bit over in being space, we call it Hilbert space, what if we could actually just relax a little bit, and when I sent her, I could send him, and I could send her, and me, and me, and me would all agree. Well, that's like, that's big, right? You're not just regretting what could have happened. You're using it. You're teaming up with it. You're making it work for you. So obviously, there's this problem of how do you calm your other copies of yourself down. It's even harder than calming yourself down. You have to be really still very, very still, usually very cold, because if you're hot, that's kind of like you're moving around, only gets worse. And if you're just still enough, just quiet enough, you probably have to turn off the lights, you probably have to So you have a surge protector so when someone switches on a dryer across town, they don't fuzz your other self. But then they all work for you. They do things for you. They're your genies. Now, we already were doing that. We were already making them work for us without having this story. And, uh, people being what they are, what did we do with the ghostly versions of ourselves? Well, we used it to build a bomb, the biggest bomb that was ever built, the atomic bomb. The atomic bomb happens because one thing needs to get inside another thing, and if it could get inside another thing, a lot of very bad things would happen. The problem is, is that the harder you throw it at the thing, if the world was as it should be, the harder it should bounce off. But if you throw it really hard and you can figure out what these other ones are doing, then you get it inside. And you take something that was stable, the most stable thing we could imagine, which is the foundation of everything, what we call an atom, and the atom would blow. And then actually, of course, you would, you might know this, it's a chain reaction. Troy would be guided into the center of this object by his ghostly counter Troys. And then out the other side would come three Troys, each of those with ghostly counter Troys, and those three Troys would make nine Troys. And every time that happened, things would get a little hotter and a little hotter and a little hotter. And if you made those spheres collide just right, and then it becomes an engineering problem, 
then it blows. So that's what we did with our counter cells. Of course, there were other counter cells who didn't do that a little bit further away in space, and we didn't build a bomb, and we didn't do it. But this is the reality we live in. You might feel better to think that sometimes we didn't. Not that we had the free will to do otherwise, but that we actually didn't do otherwise. So, um, Viennese lost the war. I like to rub this in their faces. We won. The Americans did, at least. So, what are they doing now, playing around with their particles and their ghostly counterparticles themselves and their ghostly counter selves? Well, now we have them think. So, as Troy moves forward, and his ghostly counterparts guide him. We set it up just so that they do a calculation together. Troy moves in a way that when he shows up on our screens, he's told us something. And if you say, well, okay, you know, how fast can Troy think and where did he write all that stuff down? You say, well, he couldn't have done it on his own. We know something that we didn't know before. For some reason, the thing we always care about is factoring prime numbers. So we turn Troy into a prime number and throw him at a wall, and out the other side comes his prime factors. And the only way we can explain it, the only way we can explain how that happened, why he ended up in the place to tell us the right answer every time it was not just that they were pushing him, but that they were thinking with him. As he moved, you might say he expressed himself, he made a hypothesis. His hypothesis collided with another counter-hypothesis that existed only in a world that you and I would say isn't real. We need a bunch of these. They're called qubits. The biggest one we have is 15. What that means is that there's 15 people here, and there's 2 to the 15, maybe half a million people, Surrounding them, bumping into them, talking to them, interacting with them. So, at the other side, you have 15 registers, and some say yes, and some say no, and they've done a calculation that would have taken 500 million normal things to happen. So, if you don't believe me, if you don't think that this is real, if you think that these ghostly particles you could explain them away. They're just a fiction, a story. They're like Odysseus. They're like Jane Eyre. Well, someone wrote Jane Eyre. Jane Eyre is not going to tell us anything new because, spoiler alert, Jane Eyre isn't real. But these fictions tell us things we didn't know. They know something, they did something, that the thing we could see in the end didn't do. This is called quantum computation. And it's why everybody wants to build one. Because imagine you had not just a computer, but an enormous number of computers. Well, you do, of course. They're just in other worlds, but if they could start working together, you would have not the power of this reality, but you would have the power of all of the other realities that we know are there. The invisible things we know must be there because of the effect they have on the visible, the effect that was too subtle for us to see, 
But the effect we can now control the thing we knew must be happening. This is one of the reasons that all of these professors had to convert over to Everett's theory. Well, a lot of them died, so that was one way. Science progresses funeral by funeral. But that turned out to be the really killer one. Who did that calculation? It couldn't have been Troy. It couldn't have been Lauren. It couldn't have been Ella. It had to be all of them. We only paid for one. I suppose it's because we spend a lot of time doing calculations. We think it's really important. We're less impressed by pushing things around. Why don't we feel it now? The Simon scratching his nose and the Simon sneezing and the Simon here, Simon telling a different story, the you that did a different thing. Why don't you feel them bumping you around and you know, maybe even better, why aren't they helping you figure things out the way they do in a quantum computer? It's not that these other selves get bored with us. It's not that they leave us behind. It's not that they run away. It's not that they vanish away from us. They get too far away. It's not like the things that could have been recede. <laughs> it's actually the opposite. The reason you don't feel your other selves the way the tiny things do all the time is because there's so many of you. There's so many things that could have been you and that are actually right here, right now. And if you could shut all of them up but one, you could feel it. But you can't. That would be called, it's called post-selection, and if you could do post-selection, then you could do a lot of things that we'd really want to do, like go back in time, which you can't do so far. Joke had to be told. The problem with your other selves, the problem with knowing what the world is like if you had done something different, is not the problem of distance, it's the problem of entanglement. You're so close to all the things that could have been. You're so interlocked with them. There's so many of them. They're moving so quickly. They hold themselves together so tightly. This one happens pretty quickly. That's the problem. They get too close. Their movements get too rapid. Their tugs get harder and harder to predict. You're unable, in fact, to unravel all the things that are happening around you to figure out, well, OK, this, th this one is doing I want to know about this one. But there's all these other ones pulling at you. You don't know which tug is coming from where. Entanglement leads to decoherence. There's no longer a signal that you can hear, no longer a signal that you can read about what's actually happening. Well, that's fine, right? We're good at pulling out signals. A lot of chaotic things happen every day, and we just build bigger and bigger computers. So can't we talk to our other selves? Couldn't we actually say, OK, just sit here for a second and listen to that guy who didn't do that thing? Don't think about him. Just listen to him. Couldn't you tease it out? Well, what do you do? Well, you say, OK, I can't do it, so a computer can do it. So I'll build a computer. 
And how big does that computer have to be? Well, the problem with building a computer in the matrix, right, is that it's still a computer in a matrix. It's not the computer that's running the matrix. So any machine that you tried to build to untangle them would be a machine that couldn't do it. In fact, what would happen is all of the yous that are typing into that machine and desperately trying to contact your other self would just crowd further and further on you. The very things that you had recruited to help you figure out what it was like to be the other person who is real, who's out there, who's tugging at you all the time, the very thing you built would actually just make the whole problem even worse. Because you're trying to listen to that person who did the other thing, and now there's a person building a computer right next to you. The bigger the machine, the bigger the problem, the harder the question, the harder the answer. So then, if it's all about pulls and tugs, if it's all about the selves that could have been pulling the selves that are, or are for us, and if the problem is purely about disentangling the tugs, and we can't disentangle the tugs, then all we are is a bunch of tugs. All we are is the tangle. We're not the things that look like they're being tangled because all the things in here are being tangled. All the things inside each body are being entangled. All there are are the tugs. You might say, oh, I'm going to tease them apart. I'll isolate them. I'll find the tugs. I'll pull it apart. I'll see the world as it is. That's all there is. That's the best code that you can write. A lot of things make sense in retrospect. A lot of the patterns we saw, a lot of the phenomena that we were desperate to explain, the lines in the sun, the spectra of a light bulb, and they're all explained by one thing. They're all explained by the fact that reality, or at least what we thought was reality, what we thought was the world, the very outer boundary, what could be beyond what is, we're not the center at all. What is, is not everything. Our little slice of the world, our little slice of reality, is just one person tangled up in a whole bunch of others. Who's the center of the snarl? Who's the person in the middle? Who's the one who's real? And who are the ones who are just fake, made up? You have to be careful here because if there's a you that says that all the other ones are fake and made up, there's another you that's saying you're fake and made up. So the least you could do is be polite. When things get bigger, they get stranger. We don't like being moved from the center. We don't like being told that the earth goes round the sun, that as Stephen Hawking said, we are a green chemical stun, scum on a minor planet in the south hills of a really dull galaxy, in an exceptionally boring part of a cluster. We don't mind hearing it now because we know this, all educated people know this. But we don't like being told that what's real is not all there is. We want it to be a metaphor. We want to say, yeah, you know, we're not at the center. There's a lot of other things, you know, things that matter. But no, to actually be told that we're not at the center, even when the evidence says we are, the smartest people 
never wanted to say it. Everett left physics. He went to work for the Department of Defense. We don't really know what he did afterwards because it's all classified. Maybe it's a loss for us. He got a much higher salary for working for the DOD. And he also drank and smoked himself to death. It's a very strange story. He didn't commit suicide. He just ran himself into the ground. And not just like, you know, regular old hangovers. He was functional. He got paid. But he treated his body like a trash can, his son said. It didn't seem like he cared whether he lived or died. Maybe he knew something we didn't. 